So I've been working on a repeater system recently. This is the two antennas that we've installed. They're both folder dipole VHF antennas. You can see that we've stacked them one above the other on uh, this pole here. Now this repeater is located above a city and you can see here, this is the view from basically where those antennas are. And a majority of our users for the repeater are down here in the sort of this valley or sort of this basin here. You can see most of the city and there's a couple of users sort of out here as well, but a majority of them are down here. And what we want to do is we want to phase these two dipole antennas to increase the gain on our system and the coverage. You see, here's a model of those two antennas. This is in MMANA and you can see that I've put basically those two antennas, the spacing, uh, the spacing between them and the spacing out from the pole here into the model. And if we just have a look at what the model looks like, this is the pattern of the antenna in the X and Y axis. If you want to use, by the way, this software MMANA, there's plenty of videos available on the internet of how to get started with this. But you can see I'm quite happy with this pattern. But this is the, if you're looking sort of straight down, looking at the top of the antenna, if you were above it, uh, this is what the pattern would look like in the azimuth plane. If you want to look though, or the horizontal plane, if you want to look at it though in the vertical plane, which is what I'm interested in, is here on the right. And you can see here that a majority of our RF basically goes out towards the horizon here on the X axis. It's actually just a little bit off because of the pattern, but majority of our um, RF goes out there. So that's fine, but the problem with doing that is this, as you could see, if most of our RF is going out here towards the horizon, that's fantastic for working long distance and lots of stations who are, you know, at the horizon or over these mountains. But what about all of our users down here? Maybe they're running handhelds, they're right underneath the mountain. By the way, this is on a 4,000 foot mountain that's directly over the city, so it's quite high. So if someone's running a handheld radio down here with a less than optimal antenna inside perhaps, they might not get as much signal down in here because the majority of the signal from the lobe of the antenna is towards the horizon. And that's where electrical down tilt comes into it. So we could do one thing. We could tilt these antennas down towards our users down into the valley. The problem is, is that then we would actually be wasting a little bit behind us, even though this pole uh, does reflect a little bit. As you can see here, there's not as, this is behind the pole here. It's, there's, you lose a bit of gain in that direction. It's still gonna be going up towards the sky and it's a little bit of a waste to be quite honest. So what we wanna do is we wanna electrically down tilt by moving the vertical plane of the antenna down towards where our users are. Now, the way that we phase our two antennas together is using one of these. This is a two-way power splitter. It has a common input, which is from our basically our repeater. And then we've got two ports here. One goes to each dipole antenna. And there is a 3 dB half power loss on each side because we're feeding both dipoles with an equal amount of power which means that we also have to run equal feed lines all the way to the antennas. You can do this with phasing harnesses outside. So you could see here that I could put a phasing harness outside here, but because of the elements and the and how rough it is at this particular site, I didn't want to get any water in a phasing harness. So what we ended up doing was running the same length cable from both antennas back down and into the uh, location where the rack of the repeater is and we're going to run one of these which so that that would be all fine but we want to be able to insert some uh, delay into one of these dipoles to electrically tilt down the beam width of the, or the main lobe of the antenna so that means that we need to feed the bottom antenna so that this antenna lags behind the uh, top antenna which will lead to our down tilt so practically, how do we do that? Well, in our splitter, when we have, say, our top dipole is connected to this side, we insert an extra piece of coax into the bottom antenna so that the RF on the bottom antenna gets to the bottom antenna slightly out of phase with the top antenna or it takes slightly longer. So how do we calculate that? Well, if we come back to MMANA in here, and what we need to do is we need to flip this model upside down because MMANA doesn't really play well with 
modeling down tilt in the software, unfortunately. So what we're gonna do is rotate this whole antenna 180 degrees so that our antenna is basically upside down, but just imagine that it's actually around the right way. The bottom antenna, because remember if we just go this way, our bottom antenna is number two here, wire number two. So if we go into our MMA sources, you can actually put in a phase degree here. So at the moment they're equal, both at zero degrees. So what we wanna do is we want to set the uh, other antenna, which is number 12, we wanna set that in front. So let's say 60 degrees. So basically here you could see that our bottom antenna is lagging behind now. It is at the zero degree point. And, uh, and we've got the top antenna is 60 degrees in front. So if you kind of think about it the other way, we've got that delay line in now because the RF is taking slightly longer to get to the bottom antenna. And if we go and have a look at our model, we can see here that our pattern has now tilted. So we've got an elevation here. Elevation is actually down tilt because it's flipped upside down of 8.3 degrees. So uh, roughly that's around about right because we're looking here at, we're about 4,100 feet above sea level. Most of this all around here is roughly about sea level. And if we do a down tilt calculator, uh, the main area that we want to cover is the city region, which is about eight and a half kilometers away from the, this location. And it works out to be around about, or eight to eight point, eight and a half kilometers. It works out to be about eight to 8.5 degrees of down tilt, which is fantastic. That's what we, what we want. The other thing is if we come back to our model and we go straight down here to zero degrees at the horizon, our gain max minus our current gain location here is about 0.7 of a degree. So we're only, le uh, de sorry, of a dB. So we're only losing, we're losing less than a dB towards the horizon, which is still good because we're within our three dB point of uh, our antenna, which is, uh, looks like going down to 27 degrees. We need a delay line that is 60 degrees long. So how do we accomplish that? Well, we need to know a couple of things first and we need to do some maths. So our maths is gonna look like this. Basically, we wanna work out the wavelength of our repeater. So we wanna do 300 divided by frequency, which in our case, our repeater is on 146.7 megahertz. So if we work that out, that is 2.025, I think. Let's bring up the calculator and have a look here. So 300 divided by 146.7, 2.045, there we go, I made a mistake, 2.045. So that's meters, that's our wavelength there. Then what we wanna do is we wanna work out the difference in our phase. So what we need to do is we need to go 60 degrees because that's what we wanted out of MMA and A here, 60 degrees, 60 degrees phase difference, divided by 360. So if you think about this, a full 360 degree um, arc is one wavelength. So we're basically looking at what the difference is between these two. So if we go to, if it was 180, for instance, 180 degrees, it would be exactly half of our wavelength. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do 60 degrees divided by 360, it equals 0.16666, so 0 0.16666. And then what we wanna do is we wanna multiply our wavelength by this number here. So we're gonna go 2.05 multiplied by 0 0.1666, which we can do here. And that gives us a length of 340, uh, well, 0 0.34 meters or 341 millimeters. So let's go 341 millimeters. Now. That is not the length of our coax because coax has delay inherent in itself. That's called the velocity factor. How quickly the signal goes through this piece of coax is different to how uh, quickly a signal goes through free space. So what we need to know is we need to know the velocity cable of uh, velocity factor of our cable that we're going to use. So I've used a couple of different um, bits of cable. This is RG214, RG214 and 213. They both have a velocity factor of 66%, so 0.66. Uh, but I've also made some out of some Superflex uh, hardline 
FSJ450. And that uses a velocity factor of 0 0.81, 81%. So it's going to vary depending on what coax you decide to use. In this case, let's start off with the length of cable that we're going to use is the Superflex because that's the one that I've measured out and the one that we want to use. So 0 0.81. So what we need to do is we need to multiply this number that we've got by 0 0.81 and that is then going to take into account the length of uh, or the velocity factor of the cable. So that leaves us with about 276 millimeters. This is known as an electrical length of the cable because it incorporates the uh, velocity factor here. So I hope that that all of makes sense. What I did was I cut a piece of cable and you can see here that I've got my end connectors on the end here. And I roughly understood that what, would, what the problem would be is trying to measure this length and to make sure that it, I get it right for what we've calculated, 276 millimeters sort of from the ends of each piece of coax, but then you've also got the connectors and you've got the, the end pin as well in there. So you've got to sort of take all of that into consideration. So what I ended up doing was I sort of estimated where the end of the coax would be and the pins, and I just made up that piece. And I wanted a way of figuring out how I could confirm that that is the correct length. That's where the nano VNA comes in and we can measure the phase difference or the phase the, the phase difference of this piece of coax using our nano VNA. So let's go over to the bench and see if we've made our 276 millimeter cable equals our 60 degrees of phase to get our down tilt. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go into the display menu, display and trace. We need to turn off all traces except for trace three. That's our S11 phase here at the top. So that's the one that we wanna use. Now, if we go back to our stimulus and we'll set our start and stop frequencies. So I'm just gonna set this start frequency to about 100 megahertz and our stop frequency at 200 megahertz. So that's our span across here. So you can see here, start 100, stop 200. And we're just gonna set a center frequency of 146.7, which is our center frequency, which is for our repeater. You can see here that the marker's all the way over to the right. So just use the buttons on the bottom to set that marker to 146.7 megahertz here, center or center frequency. And you can see that our phase number here up the top right hand corner, we can just ignore that for now because we're not calibrated. So that's the next thing that we need to do. So if we go back to calibrate and we will just go reset. So that's to reset our calibration and we go calibrate. So we wanna use our standard. So this is the open first, plug that into uh, channel zero, so port one, and hit the open calibration. Now that's done, take that off and we'll go to the short calibration. It's calibrated and then we go to the load. Again, all on port zero, port one, and that is now calibrated. Now we can do an isolation uh, calibration as well. I've only got one load, so I'm just gonna leave that on this first port here and just calibrate that. If you do have another load, you can pop it on the other port as well, but let's just do an isolation. And there we go. Now we need to do a through line calibration. Hook up our test cable through one side of this and into the nano VNA. So what we wanna do is we wanna eliminate these ca this cable here, this test cable from skewing our results. So if we go through and that calibrates the through and we can hit done. Let's just save this into a slot somewhere. Let's just go save zero. Now, if we go back to display and you can see our format. So our format at the moment is showing S11 reflected 
we've got S21 through and S11 reflected. If we just go and change our channel to S21 through, you can see here now we're showing zero degrees. So that means that we're now showing, we're not showing this cable as part of the, the test, which is exactly what we want. So what we want to do now is unplug one side of this cable that goes into our second port. And I'm going to connect this barrel in. Now this will add a little bit of delay in, not a lot in the grand scheme of things. It's a bit hard because I can't put this barrel into the circuit to actually take it out, but in any case, the effects are going to be pretty negligible. So what we do is we put in this barrel, then I'm going to put in our test piece of coax. So again, I mentioned that Superflex here that I made. I'm going to just hook that up to one side of the Nano VNA. And then I'm going to hook it into the other side, into the second port. Well, our center frequency is still 146.7. And you can see here that this has got a minus 62.7 degree phase shift difference from when we just had the test, test blue cable plugged in. So we've now got this delay set in, which is minus 60. 2.6 that's pretty much close enough for what the purposes is that we can use it for so it looks like the calculations and my connectors and everything they all come out pretty close let's just go and test another cable and we'll kind of do this a little bit in reverse so i've got this n to n piece of rg214 and of course this is going to change our calculations so let's just do this in reverse so i've made this unknown length Let's just hook it up to our nano VNA. And you can see that it, we've got minus 35 degrees. So we've got 35 degrees on that one. So this is using RG214, so 66%. So what we, uh, for our velocity factor, let's work out 35 degrees, what length that this piece of cable roughly is without actually measuring it. So we do our 300 divided by frequency. So we already know that that equals 2.045. We know that we're 35 degrees, so we can go 35 over 360, which equals 0 0.097. So we need to multiply these two numbers together and we should get 0 0.198. And then we need to multiply this, that's in meters again, multiply this by our velocity factor. So 0 0.66. So we should have a length of 0 0.131 or 131 millimeters. Let's go and see if that's actually the case. We're just, just short of 131 millimeters. So that's gonna be a combination of slight inaccuracies probably the extra bit of this barrel incorporated in here, but we're pretty close. We're close enough that that would be good enough for what we want to do. Now, if you know the velocity factor of a cable, you can use a nano VNA to figure out its exact length. But this is really handy if you've got coax, which is all spiraled up in a spool somewhere and you wanna know the physical length of the cable. Well, I'll show you in this video over here how to do that with the nano VNA.